All right, folks, welcome. Um, thanks for taking, uh, making the effort to get here on this uh, snow day in Washington. It's not really a snow day. There's like half an inch of snow on the ground, but uh, that qualifies as a snow day here in Washington. Um, needless to say, I don't think any of us expected that here in the first week of 2018, the Iran story we would be focused on would be uh, this story, the story of protests, of domestic unrest, um, really in the um, sort of biggest demonstrations we've seen since 2009. Um, on the contrary, I think that what everyone expected to be talking about this week and next week uh, was the question of sanctions waivers, uh, decertification of the JCPOA, uh, and efforts in Congress to amend uh, the INARA legislation. Um, that obviously all still is in play, but it's uh, now been cast in, I think, a quite different light by what's happening inside Iran. And so we have uh, convened a panel of our experts uh, to discuss this issue, the protests in Iran and their implications for not just the region, not just Iran, but also for U.S. policy um, from a lot of different angles. Um, so I'm going to introduce folks in the order I'm going to call on them. Um, we're going to start with Patrick Clausen. Um, Patrick is the Morningstar Senior Fellow and Director of Research here at the Institute. Um, and he's going to look at the background to these protests. Where are they coming from? What are the causes? Um, and what's been happening inside Iran, especially economically, that can explain the unrest that we're seeing? Um, then we will turn via video uh, to our colleague Medicology, who is really one of Washington's uh, most skillful interpreters of domestic events in Iran. And he'll look at where the protests are now and where they might be going in the future. Um, and then we'll turn to Mike Eisenstadt. Mike is the Khan Fellow and Director of our Military and Security Studies Program here at the Institute. And he's going to look especially at the role of the security services in these protests and also what the protest might mean, again, for the future of those security uh, forces, both within Iran uh, and outside of Iran. Uh, and then finally, I'll turn to Hanin Gadar, who's our, ins who's, uh, our Friedman Visiting Fellow, rather, um, who's going to look at how these protests might reverberate in Lebanon, um, outside of Iran's borders, but certainly in places uh, where Iran is spending those billions of dollars that the protesters have cited as one of their grievances. Um, and in, throughout all of this, uh, as is our practice here at the Washington Institute, we will talk about what U.S. policymakers should be doing about all of this. Um, I think so far, I'll just give you my, my sort of uh, one minute of uh, personal take here. So far, I think the Trump administration has tried to demonstrate its support for the protesters through the president's Twitter feed, through statements by U.S. officials, um, and has tried to rally some sort of international um, response, international pressure, um, to complement the U.S. statements. Uh, I would say that so far international statements have been relatively mild, especially compared to American statements, and so that effort is still underway. And I'm sure that we'll see this effort develop um, as the days and weeks unfold. We may see some more sanctions on Iran uh, for human rights abuses, and of course I think this will inevitably play into those big decisions which are coming next week regarding sanctions waivers and the certification or decertification of the JCPOA. Um, but I'll leave my contribution at that, and I will turn now to Patrick. And we'll be speaking, I think, from the table, unless you want to come up here, Patrick. It's up to you. So my former colleagues at the International Monetary Fund in their reports about Iran's economy say what we macroeconomists would say about Iran's economic situation, namely that it's pretty good, uh, that Iran's uh, – GDP is going to grow this year more than the U.S. GDP. Iran's budget deficit is going to be smaller relative to the size of the economy than that of the United States. Iran is running a healthy current account surplus in its international trade, unlike the United States, which runs a large deficit. Uh, and so that the picture looks pretty decent. Well. I thought that it was telling that when uh, the New York Times ran a very nice article the other day by um, – about Iran's economic situation, it was written by a novelist, uh, Amir Ahmadi Aryan, who got the economic situation much better than my IMF colleagues did, which is that the – while the macroeconomic numbers may be pretty good, the situation for ordinary Iranians has not been, that there hasn't been at all a trickle-down, that in fact – 
the annual survey that Iran does of uh, the living standards of people has shown that it, the, those standards are still 10 percent, uh, or a little more than 10 percent, below where they were a decade ago. Uh, and that unemployment is rising. It's 12.5 uh, percent. Um, and in fact, we'll, the, what's happening is that as more jobs are being created in Iran, that more people are coming into the labor force. We discovered that there are a lot of Iranians who always wanted to have jobs and just gotten discouraged and dropped out of the labor force and are now coming back, coming back in. Um, and in particular, the inflation is back up again. That was the one great accomplishment of the Rouhani's first term is that he was able to bring inflation down from 43 percent per, per annum down into single digits. Well, it's back up again. And uh, furthermore, the price increases are heavily concentrated in the items that are consumed by ordinary working people. So bread prices rose for the first time in three years by 15 percent uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, Iranians, by the way, eat 353 pounds of bread a year. Think about that. That's impressive. Uh, and um, famously, uh, egg prices and chicken prices are up sharply. Uh, furthermore, um, as Mr. Aryan pointed out, uh, the rich in Iran are flaunting their wealth. Uh, I recommend the Instagram account that has well over a quarter million followers, um, which is called Rich Kids of Tehran. Uh, you can see the, of the lifestyles that are truly ostentatious. I mean, if you're in the market for a nice Maserati, for instance, you can see a good selection of them uh, and uh, the parties that they throw, the clothes that they wear. Uh, I know um, enough, thanks to my significant other, about clothing to say that's expensive. Uh, and then, frankly, it looks like nothing so much the feel of what's going on in Iran at the moment is nothing so much like what happened uh, in the Shah's days, where the Shah in 1971 organized a coronation ceremony at Persepolis, uh, bringing th uh, thousands of foreign guests, uh, chefs from France. Uh, they drank over 2,000 bottles of wine. I mean, it was the ostentatious wealth. Uh, and the Shah's government really shifted from concentrating on national economic development to concentrating on uh, the good times uh, for the select few. And that is increasingly what the Islamic Republic feels like. So that's the overall picture behind these protests. Uh, now, let me focus on two specific issues, though. One is the, the cost of Iran's destabilizing foreign activities. Uh, we often say that, oh, well, their support for these various terrorist movements and their nuclear programs really not that expensive. Well, that may be true in absolute numbers if you compare it to the United size of the U.S. economy, but it's not particularly true compared to the size of Iran's economy. Uh, now, we don't have precise numbers, obviously, on how much they spend on supporting uh, the Syrian government and various terrorist groups. And the U.S. government uh, often likes to use I mean, its internal thinking the number $7 billion a year, um, which I think is a bit high. Uh, but if we throw in the, the nuclear program and the missile program, it, it's certainly in the billions of dollars. I think that it would be very hard to make the argument that the expenditures are less than about 4 or $5 billion a year, um, roughly half of that going to the Syrian government. Uh, big chunk going to Hezbollah. Uh, that nuclear and missile program is not cheap either. And, and at four to five billion dollars, that, that's one percent of GDP. Well, by comparison, one percent of GDP in the United States would be 180 billion dollars. Now, I don't think anybody would say that 180 billion dollars is a small amount of money. Well, one percent of, of GDP is real money. And, and that's a minimal estimate. As I say, the, what the U.S. government usually uses is an estimate twice that. And furthermore, that's just for the direct costs. If we throw in indirect costs, we get a lot higher number. So for instance, the uh, new budget that uh, was proposed by President Rouhani and, uh, for the next fiscal year in Iran uh, says that military expenditures are going to be $12 billion. Well, much of that's frankly not necessary, except because of Iran's adventurous foreign policies. And so certainly there's another at least 1 percent of GDP uh, that is due to the adventurous foreign policy. Um, by the way, that $12 billion estimate, uh, some people have said, oh, he's trying to inflate it in order to embarrass the uh, 
uh, Revolutionary Guards. Um, actually, that's finally brought the Iranian government estimate of what it spends on, on the military close to that of international institutions like the, uh, uh, the usual arbiter of these things, uh, CIPRI, the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, which says that Iran's military spending is $12 billion a year. So my first point would be Iran's destabilizing activities are, in fact, real money. Uh, and indeed, it's instructive that the amount of money that Iran is spending on these activities, minimal estimate, 1 percent of GDP, uh, that is more than the budget cuts that Rouhani proposed. Uh, he proposed cutting in half the expenditure in cash money to be given to the uh, ordinary Iranians. Uh, and uh, that would not have been necessary except for the this expenditure on these destabilizing activities. Well, my second point would be things could get a whole lot worse. Um, the that's not me. Um, the banking system in Iran is tottering. There has been an explosion of credit institutions that are kind of like credit unions in the United States. Uh, that now hold about 25 percent of deposits. And uh, many of them are connected with the Revolutionary Guards. Many are collected, connected to, to prominent clerics who claim that they're collecting Islamic taxes. And th these credit institutions have paid little attention to the Central Bank of Iran. And uh, they've been paying outrageous deposit rates and charging outrageous loans. When you're charging 35 percent a year for loans, I can tell you there's not a whole lot of economic act legitimate economic activities that can pay that kind of interest rate. And uh, several of them failed in November. And we saw street protests in, in Tehran, the first time we've seen chants of death to Khamenei were during those street protests. Uh, there is no system of deposit insurance in Iran. If a credit institution fails, you lose your money. Um, the banks are in not much better shape. They are desperate for liquidity. They've been borrowing from credit institutions. Um, the Central Bank of Iran has put a cap on the amount that institutions can pay in interest. Ninety percent of the institutions were violating that cap as of last June. Um, and the uh, uh, Central Bank has been trying to get Iran's banks to report under Iran's generally accepted counting practices, not the international generally accepted counting practices, but just Iran's generally accepted counting practices. And uh, the few banks that have done that have uh, gone from reporting profits to massive losses. The government has spent two years dithering about this situation. There's been no action on proposals to modify the central bank law to allow it to regulate the credit institutions. And uh, th this is a classic recipe for, uh, di for disaster. Um, if you think that I'm exaggerating, let me just quote from uh, Rouhani's speech to the modulus in which he was introducing the budget. He said, quote, 25 percent of the money market is in the hands of six fraudulent institutions. When they want, they interfere with the money market, the gold market, and the real estate market. I have raised this issue in, in detail with great urgency with the supreme leader to discuss how three to four million people are having their lives totally ruined by the actions of these fraudulent institutions. I've gotten pressure from all sides. You will not believe the pressure and letters that I started to get from different institutions of the state. Frankly, the banking system in Iran could collapse. And as I say, there's no deposit insurance. This, by the way, is what keeps Iran's banks isolated to the international financial system, independent of what happens with U.S. sanctions, independent of what happens with the Financial Action Task Force, which is meeting later this month and may uh, will evaluate how Iran's action plan is going. Uh, it is this problem with the banks which it keeps the banks away from the international financial institution. Finally, one last word of pessimism about um, we economists like to steal from other social scientists, so let me steal from demography. Uh, demographers tell us that it's young people who go out in the streets and protest, and that's, of course, what you've seen here. Uh, in fact, there's a general rule of thumb that uh, revolutions are more likely to occur in countries where the median age is under 26. Uh, 
which is where Iran was in 1999. But Iran's population is rapidly aging. Today, the median age in Iran is the exact same as the median age globally. It is slightly higher than the median age in Israel. And it is <clears throat> eight years higher than the median age in Egypt and Pakistan, 10 years higher than the median age in Iraq or India, and 11 years higher than that in Afghanistan. So with the average age in Iran being 31, and revolutions rarely occurring when the average age in a country is over 26, I'm afraid demography does not give us a basis for optimism. By the way, uh, within the decade, the average age in Iran will get to be 36. All right. Thank you, Patrick. Um, I feel like with uh, everything that's happened in 2017 and 2018 so far, we all feel like we're rapidly aging, not just the Iranians. <laughs> but, um, so we're going to turn now to Mehdi Khaliji, who should be joining us via video. And I see that we have him uh, right here. So Mehdi, take it away. Oh, we cannot hear Mehdi. Just one moment while we sort this out. Pantomime. Corey, should I move on to the next speaker, you think? Is this, uh... um. <coughs> oh. uh, can, you, can you hear us? Can you hear us? Um. All right, so yeah. while, while um. we start on these technical issues, maybe let's move to Mike Eisenstadt uh, as our next speaker. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Um, let me just say that uh, first, you know, I think um, the first thing I would say is that the regime has been very effective in closing down um, information coming out of Iran, and as a result, it's been very hard to really um, read events there. As it is, in any, it's hard enough, even when there is a flow of information in these kind of um, developments, to read events going on thousands of miles away during potentially violent and potentially revolutionary situations. Um, but the, even the videos that have been getting out have been very low quality, and it's been very hard to judge which units are involved and exactly what's going on on the streets there. So that said, my comments are somewhat tentative, but I think there's a number of things that are rooted in long-term trends in Iranian society and in terms of the way that the regime has responded to previous bouts of violence, which enable us to at least create a framework of analysis here. So let me just say the first thing in talking about these kind of events in Iran is to understand that the, founder, the founders of the Islamic Republic are revolutionaries, and there is nothing that revolutionaries fear more than counter-revolution. Because, first of all, they know that revolutions can occur. They made, they made a, rev res a revolution once in their youth. Also, the political style in Iran, the political culture is rooted in kind of conspiratorial worldview, which tends to see um, conspiracies roiling all around the Islamic Republic. And actually, some of these conspiracies are true. There have been conspiracies in the past. So that also kind of you know, informs the regime's response. And then finally, th what they've seen is that in the past, um, many of the um, events of uh, outbreaks of violence and whether it be in 2009 or 1999 or in the mid-90s, 94, 95 period, were in uh, cities and were w done by, in many cases, the urban middle and upper middle classes. Now we see a, a series of protests which involve the provincial working class. Um, and while the, the recent events have exposed deep class and regional cleavages in Iranian society, it does not bode well for the future. I mean, one of the people, one of the things that people said in 2009 is that if only the people of Tehran and the other large cities that were protesting from the urban middle and upper cla middle classes could get the rural working classes involved, the regime would really be in trouble. Well, they're involved now, but the urban middle class and upper middle class in Tehran is more interested in evolutionary 
change and reform and not revolution. But this does not bode well for the future because the most important classes in, in, the, in the country are shown to be, um, at least elements of those classes, to be um, uh, disaffected from the regime. Another thing that the regime is concerned about is that in the past they've been very uh, concerned about invasion, and rightfully so. Uh, during, um, historically, Iran has been invaded uh, um, a number of times. The Arab invasion, uh, the Mongols, uh, World War II, the Brits and the, and, and the uh, Russians. Um, and then you had Iraq in 2003. But after 2003, with the U.S. getting mired in um, uh, insurgency, counterinsurgency campaigns in Iraq and Afghanistan, those fears have diminished somewhat. And Iran has been more concerned about what they call soft, war soft warfare, efforts to subvert the regime. Um, now, Iran has great strategic depth or geographic depth to deal with invasion. They have mountains around the perimeter of the country. But every Iranian citizen is vulnerable to messages, subversive messages from outside the country brought in by satellite TV, the internet, and the like. So they have no strategic depth in that area. So that's why they put a lot of emphasis on jamming satellite communications, um, controlling the internet, and the like. Now, let me just say a few things about the lessons that the people who rule Iran today drew from their experience in making the revolution against the Shah. And these lessons learned have been modified by their own experiences in dealing with subsequent bouts of violence, as I mentioned before, in the mid-90s and 1999, 2009, and, and now most recently, the most recent round. First, the need for strong, decisive leadership by the political echelon. The Shah was constantly riven by doubts and um, about, about well, first of all, he was suffering from uh, health problems with cancer. Um, he was on medications. He was uh, constantly fearful that the United States would abandon him and throw him under the bus and was conspiring with the opposition against him. And as a result, he, showed the he, he, didn't, have, he didn't show the necessary resolve when, um, when, it, when push came to shove to do what, it, what needed to be done from the regime's point of view in order to stay in power. And as a result, the Islamic Republic has by and large been very... Um, uh, quick in responding to uh, signs of, um, uh, of opposition to the regime. And we've seen this, although in this case, in this current case, I think they've, because of the social base of the opposition this time, I think they were a little more hesitant than they have been in the past. For reasons I'll explain more in a minute, it has to do with the social composition of the security forces, I think, at least in part. And, and there's also political uh, considerations as well. Secondly, the security forces must be adequately resourced and be given clear guidance and enjoy strong political support. Now, the Shah has converted his military from a pillar of the regime to a regional power projection force um, during the course of his rule. So when the events in 78 and 79 occurred, they weren't really prepared for internal security. Um, and as a result, they performed, they did not perform well in this role, um, either acting with um, excessive or, or insufficient restraint in some occasions, resulting in you know, large numbers of uh, casualties, but not enough casualties to nip in the bud the, op the, uh, the, the, uh, the re revolution and to cow the opposition. So it was kind of really the worst of both, both worlds. And also the Shah's response and um, his self-doubts also prevented the military from operating effectively. The security forces must also be properly trained, equipped, and employed. Now we've seen Iran has spent a lot of money on their riot forces. And you can see in the equipment that they bring um, when, they, when they face the public. They have special units with um, riot gear. Um, I'm not sure the training is, is so great. Um, that's, that's one issue where I, I think they uh, could use uh, more work. But one thing that's been very important as a result of their experience in the revolution, what happened during the revolution against the Shah is that when there were people killed, you had a 40-day mourning period and at the end of the 40-day mourning period for the people who were killed in the previous round of demonstrations, you'd have more demonstrations with more people killed, and you had this snowballing effect. And as a result, the current regime is very careful in its use of lethal force in order to prevent that kind of dynamic from happening. So as a result, they tend to rely on truncheons and face-to-face and -face violence on the street, and by and large, the, only the very discriminate use of firearms. There have been some cases that I think perhaps due to indiscipline, firearms have been used or maybe it was uh, selectively uh, done um, in the current round of violence, but they're very careful not to um, um, avoid, uh, to uh, engage in lethal overkill. 
And then finally, morale and cohesion of the security services must be preserved. During the Shah's rule, um, a lot of the junior ranks of the, of the military, um, the junior officers had recently um, gotten college degrees, and they were exposed on the campuses to many of the revolutionary currents then um, present in Iran. As a result, many of the junior officers were sympathetic to the opposition, as well as many of the enlisted ranks who were from the same social background of many of the people who had made the revolution. And this has been a constant problem or a constant fear of the Islamic Republic. Now, this was not so much of a problem maybe in, in 99 or 2009 when still a lot of the security forces who are, you know, by and large drawn from, you know, not from major cities or from, you know, middle and lower middle classes and the working class were dealing with upper middle class people and there's a class divide that was at work there. Um, but um, during the current round of violence, this has uh, been a real problem because now you have the Mustafafin, the people who, in theory, the revolution was made for, facing against, against the security forces who are supposed to be protecting those people and representing those people and drawn, and in many cases are drawn, drawn from those uh, parts of Iranian society. So this has also been a factor, I think, in, in their kind of very restrained and careful response in dealing with the current um, uh, violence. That said, let me just discuss, and I'll, I'll wrap it up in just a couple more minutes, um, Iran's method, um, their, their, their art and science of social control. Um, as I mentioned, trying to avoid large and le uh, large scale use of lethal force. There's no Tiananmen Square moments like we saw in Tiananmen Square when you had the, uh, the, the protests in China. The army went out with tanks on the streets. You don't see that in, in Iran today, in part because there's also, again, fear that this would fracture the military, but also, again, they don't want to set in, set in train this kind of snowballing effect of opposition against the regime. Prefer face-to-face -face melees involving truncheons and, and in, in, in previous rounds of violence there were chains involved. You know, you know, the security forces would come with chains and that would cow the people who are less stout-hearted among the opposition. But who, who wants to deal with you know, face-to-face -face violence? It's, it's very intimidating um, and, and, and has, it has uh, a, a cowing effect on the opposition. They prefer to identify leaders of the opposition and pull them away, put them under house arrest, induce uh, uh, confessions about, you know, that they're working with foreign intelligence services and thereby demoralize the opposition. And as we saw in 2009, also a lot of comet protesters were brought in um, subject to all kinds of mistreatment, sexual and scatological humiliation, um, sleep deprivation, um, and then they were set loose to go home to tell people what they experienced in, under detention, which was extremely humiliating and, 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 and had a dramatic psychological impact in terms of demoralizing the opposition. So under, undermining the morale of the opposition is, is really a very, is, is key to how the Iranians do it. They basically focus on, as I mentioned, decapitation, but then what do you do in the current case when you have a leaderless opposition? Decapitation doesn't work under current circumstances, but patient attrition, demoralization of the opposition, pushing back gradually over time, I think is, is their preferred um, a quote, the, the fir preferred way of doing these things. And let me quote here from Mazir Bahari, who was a Newsweek correspondent who was in Tehran in 2009 to cover the um, uprising then, where he talked about what was, he was told by a, um, a, a government minister about the techniques of the Islamic Republic for dealing with these, with these problems. He said, the minister said, the problem with the Shah's secret police was that they thought they could break a prisoner's will through physical pressure. But that often just hardened the victim's resolve. What our brothers after the revolution have masterminded is how to break a man's soul without using much violence against his body. I think that really encapsulates kind of the, 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 the regime's approach to dealing with um, these kind of problems. So how does this end and where does this go? First of all, I have no idea exactly um, the f future trajectory of violence um, and, 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 and opposition in, in, in Iran. Um, these things are impossible to um, you know, predict. To some extent, it'll be a function of how the regime handles it. If they engage in missteps, we could see a dramatic increase in violence. If they, you know, you had in, in Iran Black Sunday in September of uh, 1978, where several hundred people were killed in one day, and that further energized uh, the revolution. So if they engage in missteps, it could, it could add a new impetus to the, to the opposition. Um, long term, I think in the past, we've seen Iran, after 2003, after, for instance, the U.S. invasion of Iraq, 
Iran devoted a lot more resources to internal security forces that would have to fight an American invasion force. So I think we're likely to see the diversion of resources in coming years more to internal security, away from force building that might be, ha have use in um, external operations. But that said, in terms of Iran's deployments in places like Syria and, 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 and um, Yemen and Iraq, by and large, they're using very small numbers of people from a very small portion of the military, the Quds Force, um, and, and also some other parts of the, of the IRGC. Um, it's never been less than a fraction of 1% of the Iraq, Iranian military that's been deployed overseas as part of their um, regional activities. So I don't really think it'll have a major impact on their activities in Syria, for instance. And anyhow, Syria's coming, kind of winding down. And Iranian casualties in Syria in the last month or so are, are, are way down over previous months. So to the degree that people are demanding an end to Iran's foreign in, in interventions, they could say, look, we're already kind of, you know, we're pulling back and we're re retrenching. Um, you know, deaths in Syria in December were way down compared to um, the previous month, about less than half, from I think 12 to 5. And I think all they have to do is use more Lebanese Hezbollah and Iraqis and Afghani fighters, and, and they'll be okay in that regard. Finally, in terms of policy recommendations, what we should be doing, I think by and large events in Iraq, Iran will be affected most by developments on the ground. But I think it's important that we do certain things in order to, first of all, to shield to the degree that we can the Iranian people from the um, uh, harsh, potentially harsh um, act actions by the regime. Um, and create space, space for the opposition to continue to protest peacefully. Again, for the longer, the longer these go on, the more it'll have an impact on the economy. And there's no reason for us to actually, in, in that light, to snap back our nuclear sanctions because these will have an impact on slowing down the economy. Just because people, A, will stay home because of the security situation and they won't go to work. And B, any company that was thinking about investing in Iran now, I think will think twice. And, and the numbers that we're thinking of investing, I think were much less than expected because of um, the threat of American sanctions and the like. And I think this will only further chase um, potential investors away. So um, I think really, you know, there's no need for us to um, waive the nuclear uh, to, to not waive the nuclear sanctions now. We should continue with the policy we're going. Don't, don't you know, pull out of JCPOA um, because that will re redirect the attention of the Iranian people from the regime's inability to solve their financial problems to us, and we shouldn't make the United States the issue here now. And I'll conclude my comments with that. So thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Mike Eisenstadt. Um, I think we're ready to go now with uh, Medicology. So let's uh, try turning to him once again. We still cannot hear Mehdi. Uh, can you try talking again, Mehdi? Sorry about this. I have to. Uh... I assure you that normally Mehdi is audible <laughs> when he speaks. <laughs> He, so he can hear us, but we can't hear him still. So, so maybe we should move on to. All right. So we, so we'll uh, move on to Hanin. Uh, it's sort of a game of musical chairs here. Um, <laughs> Hanin Gadar, uh, take it away. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Michael. Um, the protests that we are witnessing today in Iran are not really restricted to Iran in the sense. Welcome that to Blue Jeans. Apologies. To connect to the. <laughs> If you're a Can you hear you? Can you can you ask me to say something in the microphone? Medi, Medi, can you hear us? So Medi can hear us, we can't hear him. So Corey, let's just move on to Hanin. Let's uh let's just move forward. Thank you. Okay. Um so the uh discontent and the anger that has sparked the protests in Iran uh, that we are seeing today is not really restricted to Iran when it comes to uh, Wilayat al-Faqih and the regime's uh, operations in the region. Hezbollah, that is leading Iran's military operations in the region, is also facing its own and very similar challenges in its own constituency, mainly in Lebanon. The context 
And the signs of discontent in Lebanon within the Shia community per se are very similar to what we're seeing in Iran today and, and the background of these protests in Iran. A little bit about the context here. The accumulating anger that led to these protests have We've been seeing a lot of signs of also accumulated anger within the Shiite community in Lebanon. This has increased drastically with Hezbollah's involvement in the war in Syria. Uh, not only because the war in Syria is dragging and the war in Syria is, has, has caused the Shiite community more deaths, more losses than in all Hezbollah's wars combined, but mainly because it has affected the economic situation of Hezbollah's constituency as well. In Lebanon, the only two institutions that are actually paying salaries on, in, on time today are the Lebanese government and Hezbollah. The, uh, the rest of the uh, private sector, uh, uh, local NGOs, even in, except for the international companies, of course, uh, are going through major economic uh, problems. So Hezbollah and the Lebanese state are still paying sa salaries on time. Lebanese state to a certain extent, of course. Uh, there are... In Dahi itself, which is Hezbollah's southern suburbs, uh, knowing that there are 4.5 million Lebanese in Lebanon, in Dahi itself you have 700,000 residents. And within the Shia community as a whole, uh, according to estimates, a quarter of the Shiites in Lebanon are on Hezbollah's payroll. The rest are facing problems. So what's happened, this is, this is just uh, the context. The, with the Syria's war, like in the also budgets in Iran and the prob economic problems in, in Iran, in the Syria's war, Hezbollah's budget did not really decrease, but it has changed and altered drastically. In the past, before the war in Syria, uh, the whole Shia community was benefiting, benefiting from Hezbollah's social services, which has also sometimes served uh, non-Shiites in Lebanon, allied. Lebanese. Uh, at one point, this circle of beneficiaries started to shrink to only Hezbollah's uh, uh, Shiites, Hezbollah's constituency, not all of the Shia. And today, social services, because of these budget cuts, have shrank, is only catering for, to Hezbollah's fighters and their immediate families. So what we have today is Hezbollah paying salaries for people to go fight and people are going to fight in order to get these salaries. Because for these people, it's not really about the same, um, uh, they're not really fighting for the cause. They don't really feel that they be, they, they're doing this for, because seriously, the, the road to Jerusalem passes through Damascus and Zabadania and Aleppo. They don't really believe that. They're doing it because the salary is available. For the rest, the economic problems have really uh, uh, increased, and the uh, class division, divisions in Dahi are very clear today. If you go to Dahi today, you have very, very, very poor neighborhoods and very rich neighborhoods. The middle class neighborhoods are starting to disintegrate into poor or rich, like Hat Tahrik, which was considered a middle class neighborhood. It's part of it today is very poor and the rest is rich. The rich are benefiting from the war in Syria and the poor have no options but to fight in Syria. So, and those fighting in Syria are not only getting the salary but also getting the whatever is left of the social services and their families. So what you have today is a huge gap, not only a class division, but also a huge cultural gap between the fighters and the non-fighters. And this is creating serious tension between the two communities within the Shia communities, the fighters community and the rest of the community, the Shia community, including Hezbollah's community. So, and this, the signs of this discontent had been expressed several times in Lebanon, and we, there have been protests inside Dahi, which is Hezbollah's stronghold in Beirut. There has been protests that was not really reported because they were not considered important and because they were contained very quickly. But there have been a protest. One of them was probably more important than the other in the most, in the poorest neighborhood in Hezbollah's uh, stronghold, which is Hayat Sillam in Beirut. For the first time, the Shiites in Dahi went to the street. Not for the first time they went to the street, but the for, for, for the first time they went to the street and actually bad-mouthed Hassan Nasrallah and Hezbollah and the war in Syria. This has never happened before, and this happened only a few months ago. There have been some economic protests 
a protest against uh, inflation, protest against uh, 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 social services. But this is for the first time there have been protests inside Dahi by Hezbollah supporters against political issues. So this has been the case. Only last year, during the municipal elections in Lebanon, in some of Hezbollah's uh, headquarters in the, uh, in the Bekaa, Baalbek city, which is mostly Shiites, 45% uh, of the Shiites in Baalbek uh, voted against uh, Hezbollah and Amal combined. Which, and this, has, this is only one example of many places in Lebanon where the Shiites voted against Hezbollah. So these are like some signs of discontent that are in a way similar to what we're seeing uh, in Iran today. Um, the protests have been contained by force. The people who uh, badmouthed Hassan Nasrallah and Hezbollah were forced to apologize in front of the camera. And they apologized because of fear, not because of regret. And it doesn't mean that discontent is, 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 has gone because nothing has really changed. And we are looking today at 2018 as the next step for Hezbollah and the Lebanese in general, where we have, have a, the parliamentary elections, the next parliamentary elections in May 2018. Hezbollah is already seen by the Shiites in Lebanon as the authority without services. And in 2018, it will be the authority when they win almost 70% of the parliament in Lebanon. And they will be definitely, like officially, the authority that democratically won <laughs> Lebanon. And they will also keep on having decreased social services and decreed uh, that but the Shiites will still be not benefiting from, from this authority. Which means that we, I will not be surprised if we see more protests within the Shia community. And also this depends if, if, if the protests continue in Iran and if things start to, to develop more in Iran. In Lebanon, this will reverberate and the Shiites in Lebanon will see that it is a for them to go more because they're already there. They, it's, it's, the, the discontent hasn't gone away. And it's not really a co coincidence. When the Hayat Sillam protest happened, there was a very a video that went viral of women, a woman uh, telling, bad-mouthing Hassan Nasrallah and telling Hassan Nasrallah that he has forced her and other women within the Shia community in Lebanon to sell their bodies in this muta temporary marriage. Muta marriage is a temporary marriage only among the uh, Shia, encouraged basically by uh, Wilayat al-Faqih ideology. And it's basically, it's a legal prostitution encouraged by Hezbollah, and it's also very popular in Iran. This woman basically was telling Nasrallah that his war in Syria is forcing them to sell, sell their bodies through muta. And it's not a coincidence that one of the first videos that we saw in Iran during these protests also is from a woman in Iran streets saying the same thing. It's not a coincidence because the grievances are the same and the context is the same. Thank you. All right, thank you, Hanin. So uh, dare, I, dare I ask if we can try one more time for Mehdi? Um, I apologize for these audio issues, but uh, I do want everyone to have the chance to hear from Mehdi if we can at all connect him. Hello. Do, do we have the audio, Corey, or no? Can you hear me? Hello? Oh, we, we can hear can him a little bit. Can we, can we turn him up? Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Just a moment, Mehdi. We're trying to increase your volume. Go Hello. ahead and say something, Mehdi. Is, is this okay now? Is that all right? Can people hear him? Do you, do you hear me? Okay, yes. Okay, Mehdi, go ahead. Speak loudly. Speak as loud as you okay. can, yes. Good, good afternoon, everybody. Um, as Patrick, do you hear me now? Fine? Yep, speak as loud as you can, Mehdi. Thank you. Okay. Um, recent protests in Iran are just the expansion of protests that started about three months ago in various cities of Iran, as Patrick mentioned in his speech, protesters were those who lost their money in some private banks and financial institutions. Uh, so this is not the, the whole thing is not new, but the its scale uh, is uh, obviously uh, a new uh, scale in recent years. 
Um, and it's different from what happened in 2009 because the protests in 2009 were in big cities. Now we see in remote areas, villages, uh, the cities like, you know, Ize in Khuzestan. And many of these cities' uh, names were not heard by people in Tehran or Isfahan or Shiraz. So I think the whole thing was not unexpected that much for the government. Mehdi, Mehdi I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to cut you off because it's just too quiet. I, I'm afraid that folks uh, here are just not able to, to make out what you're saying. So apologies for that. I'm going to instead move to the uh, question and answer period. So I apologize again to folks for the uh, technical audio issues there. Um, and I instead want to sort of uh, move into a Q&A uh, and discuss especially um, as I said, the implications for U.S. policy and how we see things going forward. So I'm going to give folks in the audience a chance to ask their questions. But I want to start with um, one question which I think will increasingly be on people's minds as um, these protests develop or as they subside, depending on what happens uh, over the next coming days. Um, if they don't subside, of course, I think that has profound implications for Iran and for the region. But assuming these protests are either suppressed uh, or simply fizzle out on their own, I'm curious as to what each of our speakers thinks uh, will be the longer-term implications for Iran and for the region. One thing we saw, for example, after the 2009 Green Movement was that even after the people had been sort of cleared out of the streets, that you had suddenly this um, coalition between reformist forces and the more pragmatic traditional forces, which put quite a bit of pressure on the hardline elements of the regime and ultimately um, led to, I won't say culminated in, uh, but led to the election of Hassan Rouhani. Um, so, any thoughts on what the longer-term implications of what we're seeing today might be? Well, the big question is what's going to happen when Khamenei dies? You know, everyone in Iran anticipates that that's going to happen sooner rather than later, and uh, that's going to be a real moment of transition, and that whoever takes over from Khamenei is going to have an opportunity to uh, have a reset. And the question is what will that reset look like? And I would say that uh, what these protests have done is shaken the conviction on the part of the Islamic Republic's leadership that they really have the hearts and minds of ordinary Iranians. And that, uh, that well, for all the noise that you hear in the big cities, especially North Tehran, that uh, when you get right down to it, the hearts and minds of ordinary Iranians are with them. Uh, and they can't be sure of that any longer. Uh, and they can't be sure of just how much the ideology really matters to those people. And this is a regime built on ideology. And so if the ideology is going wobbly at the knees, that, that's a big problem. I mean, look, there have already been lots of Iranian commentators who have said the last few years that Iran feels more and more like Brezhnev Soviet Union, in which everyone goes through the, action, the motions of mouthing the ideology, but that's not really what they're about. Well, of course, uh, Iran's successes abroad, uh, which um, have indeed led to quite a burst of nationalist pride in Iran, uh, as to some, let the regime kind of reinvent itself as an Iranian nationalist, at least as much as Islamic revolutionary. Uh, but if it turns out that ordinary Iranians, you know, while they may be proud of Iran's uh, uh, accomplishments abroad, they don't want to pay for it. Uh, and they, they'd really rather see the money used elsewhere. Uh, that's going to be a big problem for the regime. Hmm. Big problem for him. If I could just uh, dovetail with uh, Patrick's comments, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, many people, including myself, had thought that as a result of um, the activities of the IRGC in Syria um, um, and in Iraq against ISIL, um, the IRGC had uh, gained a kind of uh, a new degree of uh, respect in Iranian society, and Qasem Soleimani was kind of a you know kind of a rock star. Um, and what's interesting is to see the degree to which the um, hostility of many of the protesters are not just directed against the clerics, but against the IRGC, which is part of this kind of clerical military system, um, which, you know, is kind of, uh, you know, uh, deeply embedded in the economy. So there was a lot of, uh, a lot of people assumed that if there were to be a post-clerical regime, or even if the clerical regime was to continue after uh, Khamenei's death, that the IRGC's role would be even stronger in, in, in uh, um, a, a follow-on regime. And that might still be the case, but, um, you know, 
where a few months ago it looked like many people would accept that or would accept uh, Qasem Soleimani run for president, it's not clear that that's going to be uh, something that would uh, lead to a more stable uh, status quo after uh, Khamenei's death. Mm. So, I, but I, I pose it as a question, really. Um, just one one thing. Uh, I think a lot of people, like speaking of the re on the region, uh, Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, uh, Yemen, elsewhere, especially in Lebanon and Iraq, you feel that a lot of people are uh, surrendering to the idea that Iran is winning and Iran is there to stay and it's not going anywhere because everything is, is because of the status quo. Uh, any sign of weakness in Iran, uh, in the regime, and Quds Force, any any sign of weakness, I think it will uh, uh, push people to uh, to reconsider. Uh, and I'm thinking mostly uh, Lebanon today. You know, like a lot of the political forces in Lebanon today. Uh, so far, they're not there. But at one point, if this goes on, they might reconsider the recent compromises with Hezbollah regarding the electoral law, regarding the political system, how how things have changed in Lebanon recently. To the the compromises that have killed actually March 14 coalition, and these these uh, this sense of surrendering to the status quo might actually change and revive uh, forces that uh, feel like it's time to actually take a stance where mm. no one is taking a stance. Well, and I think that would be good news from uh, the point of view of U.S. policymakers. Um, so with that, let me open the floor to questions from our audience. And if uh, those of you watching uh, from your snowbound homes have questions, do feel free to sort of uh, tweet those at us. Yes, sir. Uh, Wait for the mic just one moment. Uh, whoa. <laughs> Bad his sound is and, and let me just, as low. Start, sir, let me just remind everyone that we are, of course, on the record, and of course, we're also being broadcast live. So go ahead. All right. Uh, Ken Mark, our TV producer. Can anyone offer an evaluation of the size and significance of the pro government rallies that have been taking place? Well, what's impressive about the pro government rallies is how long it took the government to organize them. And that, yeah, you know, usually uh, this—I mean, this is a regime, after all, which engages in mobilization of people on a regular basis, uh, m multiple times a year. I got a highly honed apparatus for bringing people out, and they can usually turn out hundreds of thousands of people on, on the turn of a dime. Uh, and yet, here we are, a week into the protests, a week it's taken them to get people out there. I mean, that's not very good. Uh, and um, furthermore, it should have been pretty easy because, in fact, uh, in, in the big cities is not where the protests were – most of the protests were being uh, – taking place. Um, so I, I'm, I'm impressed by how slow the government has been in their usual efforts to bus in hundreds of thousands of people. And it, it suggests to me that the usual places that they go to round up people to bus them in, you know, their free lunch and all that sort of stuff, um, they were kind of scared that people might not show up and that it wasn't as easy to round people up as it had been in the past. Now, I'm assuming that the government's going to pull out all the stops for the usual kind of big demonstrations that they have and that we're going to see some really impressive ones. But the fact that it took them a week even to get going, and today's demonstrations, uh, the pro-government demonstrations, were, were, of course, bigger than the protests. Well, what a surprise. Uh, but uh, they weren't the kind of massive sizes that we've seen in the past. All right. I think we have a question in the second row here. Uh, Mike, uh, Mike, you had mentioned that the, um, uh, you don't believe the JCPA debate should be allowed to, you know, to, to basically break that deal in order to impose sanctions again would be a, a good policy. But I guess I wanted to ask the panel about that. Um, given the economic problems that are clearly a major part of what's causing these demonstrations, people who were opposed to the JCPA argue that the economic problems would have been worse if the JCPA hadn't opened up investment and so on. So I'd just like to throw that out and ask a question about that more broadly. The second part of that is the Europeans and Russians. Um, they've been reacting to this in different ways um, in some of the statements that are being made and so on. Uh, could you describe what you see the Europeans and Russian government doing uh, in regard to what's happening now in Iran? I'd like to field uh, those questions. Yeah, yeah fine. Look, uh, the Iranians do a wonderful job of stopping people from investing in their own country. 
And uh, the biggest barriers to investment in, inside Iran has been uh, the opposition that we have seen from people inside Iran to uh, uh, the deals. Many of the deals that were signed with foreign companies were going to actually be serious economic propositions and not just ways to feather your nest. And uh, that <laughs> – that was threatening the traditional way in which the, uh, the well-connected made their money in Iran, and they didn't like it. And so there have been a lot of complaints that, well, why are you signing a deal with Total, for instance, when we could do that? And they couldn't. Uh, so th I would say that the, uh, the, the biggest problem of uh, discouraging foreign – the biggest problems that have been discouraging foreign investment have, in fact, been the uncertain business environment, the poor business conditions – and the internal infighting inside Iran that it makes it so difficult. I mean, you know, after all, uh, we're talking about a government which, when it came to power five years ago, said that within months it was going to be opening negotiations with foreign oil companies for investment inside Iran. It didn't happen. In fact, it's still not happening. Uh, and so that's really what slows things down. And I think that uh, a lot of European companies that were so enthusiastic about going into Iran, including a lot of companies that have signed these deals that you get headlines about, you know, multi-billion dollars deal signed and then nothing happens, uh, are realizing that, it, that, you know, Iran's a mid-sized market where you can make some money, but it's not going to be El Dorado. And uh, this is not going to be the savior of the, of, uh, for the Iranian economy uh, either. Um, my biggest reason for saying that uh, I don't want to see the JCPOA sanctions uh, re uh, the, the pre-JCPOA sanctions reimposed is, look, I don't want to change the topic. I want to keep the topic on the protests in Iran. Uh, I don't want to raise the, make the whole focus be on the JCPOA. I want to keep the, pro the, the protests in Iran as the, and the problems inside Iran as the, the centerpiece of uh, international attention. And the question of the European and Russian reaction? So, so, well, I'll, I'll give my own thoughts on the European and Russian reaction. I mean, so uh, what we've seen so far um, is, I think, predictable from the Russians. What the Russians have said is uh, to have basically supported the Iranian regime's line, which is that these protests are somehow foreign-inspired uh, or even the work of foreign agents. Um, this is, frankly, the similar uh, explanation that Russia would give for uh, any kind of protest within Russia itself, and so it's not surprising. Um, Russia, of course, is also one of Iran's major external allies outside the region. Um, and so, again, this is perhaps what we would expect. Um, and it's also a reason why I don't think we'll see any effective UN Security Council action, because Russia would veto such action. Now, it might be useful for the United States to put Russia in the position of having to veto any such action, um, but I think we know what Russia would do. The Europeans are more um, complicated, I think, because the United States, I believe, really would like to see um, some sort of joint statement, um, joint sentiment at least expressed between the United States and Europe to put some international pressure on the Iranian regime. But it hasn't happened so far, and instead we've seen quite mild statements from the Europeans which don't really blame anyone for what's happening and call on all sides to refrain from violence as though there was any equivalency between the Iranian security forces on the one hand uh, and these largely peaceful protesters on the other. Um, why do we see that? I think that uh, there's probably a few reasons. And I should say that those reactions are milder uh, than the European reactions in 2009 after the rigged election. Um, and one of my colleagues is actually writing a piece about this, Erica, who's sitting behind you here. Um, why is this? So um, I think there's a number of possible reasons. Um, the first is, of course, the JCPOA itself and the new economic cooperation, which Patrick uh, was just talking about, between Europe uh, and Iran. Um, I think the Europeans bristle at the idea that this is what determines their policy actions towards Iran. And if we had a European up here, they would say, no, that's, uh, that's not fair. Um, the second factor, I think, is that the Europeans have a tremendous amount invested in their relationships with Rouhani and Zarif. Um, and I think the European inclination probably is not to sort of take the side of the street protesters, but to try to uh, work in dialogue with Rouhani and Zarif and perhaps um, hope that this uh, episode will strengthen those that, that they consider their allies inside Iran. Um, third, I think, is probably fatigue with instability in the Middle East in general. Um, obviously, since 2009, a lot has happened in the Middle East, um, and Europe has uh, borne the brunt of the sort of flow of refugees that's come out of the Middle East, as well as uh, some terrorism, which has come out of the Middle East. And I doubt that they have an appetite uh, for any more such instability, and I'm sure that they're worried about that instability. And then finally, 
Um, there's certainly some concern about the United States. We have these decisions looming about sanctions waivers. Um, there's been some, obviously, serious questions about it, the American commitment to the nuclear deal. Um, and so you already start with a gap between the United States and European positions on Iran, which is quite different than 2009. Um, and I'm sure that the Europeans are eyeing those decisions next week warily and are probably careful, uh, trying to be careful not to do anything or say anything which could embolden the United States to move away from those sanctions waivers and away from the JCPOA. Um, personally, I think that this should, in fact, be a, an occasion for the U.S. and Europe to sort of join our voices together uh, and put some joint pressure on the regime on an area where we can all agree. We may not fully agree on the nuclear question or, on, or even on Iran's regional behavior, but I think we'd be able to agree on human rights uh, in Iran. So far, that's not been the case. More questions? Uh, yes, Mark Ginsburg. Uh, excellent panel. Um, Mark Ginsburg, Counter Extremism Project. And just as a derivative point, I was in the uh, White House and State Department during the 1979 decisions about how to deal with then Iranian revolution. So it's fascinating to sit here and watch you're this. Too, you're again. far too young for that, Mark. I don't uh, yeah, that. well, I, I, would, I was a mere kid then. Um, the Obama administration officials, such as Phil Gordon and Susan Rice, are urging everybody in editorial op-ed writing, be quiet. Don't do anything. Uh, don't say anything to rock the boat. And, and Patrick was absolutely right, and I agree with him about the issue on sanctions. But where do you all come out uh, as a policy for the United States where the Obama administration and its infinite uh, efforts to get the JCPOA passed put, took regime, off the regime change off the table? It seems that the Trump administration would like to put regime change back on the table. Where, where do you all come out on that issue? So let, let, me, let me just ask um, uh, Hanin if you have any thoughts on this question of, is U.S. support or silence better in this sort of circumstance? Since, of course, you're, you're coming from the region yourself. Um, I'll just note, Mark, that the Trump administration has been careful, I think, so far to say explicitly that they're not seeking to move to a policy of regime change. They've been asked this question several times over the past few days, and I think they've been uh, pretty explicit on that point. So just as a clarification. But Hanin, do you have thoughts on this? Uh, no, U.S. silence is definitely not a good idea because simply uh, knowing how Iran functions in the region, uh, specifically uh, Iran moves to fill vacuums always. Uh, it, f uh, uh, it filled vacuums uh, in Syria, in Iraq, uh, everywhere, wherever there is like... A, a, a unsettling events, they go and, and fill the vacuums. And it was very easy to, to, to know, like, the absence of uh, any American policy in Syria uh, uh, led to a stronger Iran. And, and still it's happening because there's nothing uh, is being done. And Iran doesn't, doesn't want today any confrontation with the U.S. And this was obvious. In a few, a couple of confrontations uh, in Syria, it was obvious that Iran is trying to avoid confrontations with the U.S. And silence by... Uh, uh, the U.S. at this point will throw uh, the demonstrators under the bus. I don't think uh, this is a good idea. A lot of things can be done. It doesn't have to be um, uh, direct support, but, but, but many, many things can be done in order to make sure that uh, support is provided for these demonstrators, for, uh, uh, for people in the region as a whole who are looking at Iran as a threat also needs to know that the U.S. is on their side. Mm. Yes. Can I... Uh, Look, Iran's narrative is that uh, we support friends, the United States doesn't. That's a very strong narrative which they use very effectively in lots of situations. And so if the United States government is seen as not supporting people who are protesting in, in Iran, Iran will use that once again to feed this narrative, that the United States doesn't actually come to anybody's help, help that even if they're free, uh, when you think they might, whereas Iran does quickly. Not a good idea. So on this one, I'm with Hillary Clinton. I mean, she described in 2014 the, the actions in 2009 is a big mistake. I, I'm, I'm just, I'm with her. If I could um, just, I'm sorry. Yeah, and just, it, please. On, on the question of regime change, look, the Supreme Leader has spent 20 years warning that what the United States' objective is to use cultural invasion in order to undermine the Islamic Republic. This is a man who's made it very clear that he's much more worried about Hollywood than he is about Washington. And his idea of U.S. efforts to promote regime change is Argo, all right? Uh, I mean, you know, when Michelle Obama's up there giving the uh, 
You're the, talking about the movie, not the, movie. the not the ancient Greek not vessel, ancient right? Greek. <laughs> uh, when Michelle ba- Obama's up there giving this award to this this movie, right? Uh, that feeds their image that the United States government is coordinating with Hollywood this effort to undermine the Islamic Republic. Now, many of us know the then director of the Woodrow Wilson Center's program on the Middle East, who was arrested in in Iran, um, and when she was visiting her ailing grandmother, and when um, Faced with a fascinating day on which uh, both uh, um, uh, Noam Chomsky and George Bush issued appeals for her release, um, the the, uh, regime put on a program on television in which they explained why they were holding her. And they had an animation of um, George Soros' weekly meetings with George Bush in the White House to plan how they were going to undermine the Islamic Republic. Now, not all of us knew that Mr. Soros was seeing Mr. Bush on a weekly basis. And um, we certainly didn't realize that the, what they were planning together was to overthrow the Islamic Republic. But that's what they put on television. They really believe this stuff, people. So you think that our refraining from saying the word regime change is going to change his mind when that's what he's thought for 20 years and speaks about all the time? Come on. Give me a break. If I could just uh, add just uh, two points. First, I, I would, I guess, come um, with regard to the, uh, our, our public diplomacy. I would argue for a very calibrated and um, uh, approach to our use of language in that I think, first of all, if we are too full-throated in our support for the people, first of all, ultimately, if, if the uh, protests fizzle, and you've been full-throated in your support, you only highlight your impotence, and the, uh, the regime is able to crow their success. So I think it's important for us to come out um, on behalf of the protesters and the right to protest and the right for their human rights to not be infringed by the regime, but just be careful how you do it, because also, and, and I'm not sure this really plays a big factor in the current um, context, but if you are too full-throated, um, you might also alter some people's calculus in Iran in terms of whether they want to be seen as, I mean, but there is a conspiratorial kind of approach even in Iran to looking at, at developments in their own country. It's not exclusively uh, a, a worldview that's um, that of the regime. It's also the people. And so it, it might have, it might all affect the calculus of some people who might otherwise be willing to join the opposition, but if they hear, if they looks like this is an American project, they might be less willing. I, I, I don't know. Sitting in Washington, it's really hard to know. So I would just argue for a, you know, speaking up, but not too loudly, and, and consistently, but not too loudly. Mm-hmm. On regime change, I would argue for uh, a focus should be more on destabilization than regime change. Regime change is something which, um, you know, we're not going to really have a, uh, unlikely to have a big uh, impact on here. We can, though, um, you know, in certain contexts, and I would not argue that we sh- I would argue we shouldn't do this now, but we should hold out the threat that in the context of our geopolitical con- competition with Iran in the region, if they start attacking American soldiers or American interests directly, then we will um, bring the conflict home and that there is a conducive context to that now, more so than in the past. And um, that gives us the ability to in- impose costs on them and to force them to divert resources um, and, and um, to internal security, more resources than they have in recent years. So that's the way I, I, I tend to look at this, um, you know, more in, in terms of the broader geopolitical competition. Because I, I just don't know how we engineer ge- regime change from, from Washington. Um, we, we can help around the edges at, the, at most. But, it, but we can impose costs and make um, things much tougher for them at home if they do things against us in the region that mm-hmm. we don't want them to do. Let's see, we have Alan Nikovsky, I know, has a question. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Um, Alan Nikovsky, Center for American Progress. Um, actually, I have two questions, uh, if that's OK. Um, one is. You notice some of the early demonstrations were in Ahwaz and Kermanshaw, and I just wondered if somebody wanted to comment on whether there is a meaningful minority dimension to this that um, 
is affecting the course of the protests or creates opportunities along the lines that uh, Mike Eisenstadt was just talking about. Um, second of all, some I think it was yesterday in the New York Times, sometime this week, there was an article saying that one of the early triggers uh, of the protests was a leak a few months ago of a budget that revealed spending on uh, Islamic institutions and on margin, uh, you know, and on uh, uh, clerics that had never previously been revealed. Um, and I just wonder, is anyone familiar with that document? The article didn't go into a lot of detail on it. Has it been uh, explored by experts on this side uh, of the ocean? Uh, sure. Let me start with your second question. That leak consisted of the president's speech to the modulus. Um, and which drew exactly no articles in any American newspaper whatsoever. Uh, and um, that speech is much blunter than usual. Did you, I walked in about five minutes into the uh, talk. Did you refer to this already? Uh, no, no, no. I just referred, I quoted one thing that he had to say. No, no, I quoted one thing he had to say about the banking system. But he had a lot of things to say in here. And one of the things that he did do was lay out a much more realistic number for a whole lot of things, so it's much more transparent. I mean, not only Najad's budget, one year he sent a budget which was nine pages. And basically said, I want to spend what I want to spend. That's, that was it. Give me authority to spend what I want to spend. Um, the modules didn't do that. Uh, but this, this, this year's budget speech is extremely blunt, and this year's budget is m much more honest <laughs> than in previous years. Am I going to say that's in order to provoke demonstrations? I don't think so. I mean, that fits with the whole technocratic approach through Rouhani government, which wants to have more transparency and what's, wants to, uh, you know, flush things out more. I mean, that, was, that was their aim. Wasn't to provoke demonstrations. Give me a break, right? Um, and, you know, the Revolutionary Guards has traditionally maintained that uh, uh, they spend what they feel like it, and it's not up to the modulus and the president to decide. And he's saying, no, that's not true. You've got to get an allocation and all that sort of stuff. Um, so that would be my comment on that one. On the minorities one, we put out a piece, uh, which while we were sitting here, it went out. Um, and look, uh, what it says is that uh, half of Iran is made up of non-Persians. Non and so if you're going to have the, the provinces demonstrating, you're going to have a fair number of non-Persians demonstrating. Although, by the way, interestingly, increasingly you find minorities in the, in the cities. Uh, one of the things Mehdi was going to speak about if he, is, uh, if he spoke uh, here was that a study that he's completing for us about uh, the Sea of Mashhad, where these demonstrations started. And uh, there are well over a million Sunnis living in Mashhad. They're subject to a great deal of discrimination. They're very unhappy. And the fact of the matter is that ISIS is doing quite a, a successful job in recruiting in, in Mashhad. Uh, and Iran's getting to have its, uh, a serious ISIS problems on its hands um, because of the way it treats its Sunnis. Right. Uh, so um, there are a lot of um, ethnic minority problems uh, in, uh, in Iran. And when the heartland starts demonstrating, uh, <laughs> That comes out, right? And there were a fair number of, of demands about, uh, about the problems of the ethnic minorities. Um, and, and, and ethnic nationalism has also been on the rise. I mean, there's this um, Azerbaijani nationalism, which, um, I mean, the big thing of the Azerbaijani nationalists is on December 22nd, you get uh, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of them marching four hours up a mountaintop, which, given if you know anything about Azerbaijan, where it's typically snowy at that time of year, how you get hundreds of thousands of people to march up a mountain in the snow, I don't, God only knows, but that's what they do. Okay. Hanin, can I ask you, um, just as a follow-up to Alan's question, this, this issue of the budget and this issue of how much Iran spends on its sort of foreign adventures, um, has been noticed a lot in the Western media as something that uh, seems to be animating some of these protests. I wonder how, how has that reverberated, if at all, in Lebanon, which is sort of the, uh, the destination for, for so much of that money? Has this issue of, uh, you know, suddenly Iran spending in Lebanon has become a political issue in Iran, has that reverberated, is, or is it uh, mostly unremarked? You, you mean the recent protests? The recent protests, recent that's right. Protests. Uh, so, so far in Lebanon, uh, everybody has been very, very careful looking at this because they, they don't want to uh, uh, make conclusions. Like Some are, are excited, some, uh, some are afraid, to the extent that Hassan Nasrallah gave an exclusive interview yesterday to, uh, to not comment on this. Uh, 
Uh, but this issue of, of budgets and military budgets has been a big issue in Lebanon for a very long time. This is not, uh, this is not recent, uh, mainly within the Shia community who have been affected mostly by this uh, budget, uh, budget cuts and uh, budget changes. Uh, Hezbollah in, in Lebanon based itself, built itself on three pillars. One is the resistance, which is today no longer an, a priority. Two, uh, social services, which are today drastically cut. And three is the only thing that is remaining is the Shiite identity, which is connected to the Karbala and the m collective memory of the Shia. That's the only thing that is remaining, and it's linking the people in Lebanon to the Wilayat al-Faqih in Iran. And everything else is an issue. And this has started in 2012 when Hezbollah publicly uh, uh, announced uh, its involvement in Syria and started making these budget cuts. Great. So I think we have a question in the back over here. Hello, Falcon of the Hudson Institute. Um, <clears throat> Patrick, uh, in reply to the question about the pro-government rallies, pointed out that this took quite a while and that in that sense is a kind of departure from the usual playbook. And I was wondering, in, uh, from Michael's remarks, whether there weren't additional departures from the, the usual playbook. For example, uh, it does, as far as I'm aware, they haven't deployed the Basij as they did in 2009. It's been the police force and most recently three units of the IRGC to three separate provinces. Which, um, so my question is, uh, do you feel there's considerable either uncertainty, division, um, potentially uh, damaging divisions within the leadership that in confronting this particular uh, crisis? I'll, I'll just uh, talk about the division of labor in the security forces. Um, and let me just say it, it's, it's really hard to kind of get a handle um, on, as I said, as I said, because of the poor quality of a lot of the videos that's been coming out, exactly who's, who's doing what. The impression I, I get is that, you know, based on statements of um, Iranian officials and also what you could see in some of the videos is law enforcement forces are the first line. Backed up, the law enforcement forces, the police, are the first line backed up by the besiege. Um, I haven't been seeing, although, again, maybe it, it's just not coming out, Ansari Hezbollah type, you know, vigilantes, you know, um, like we've seen in the past in, in large numbers. And that might be in part because um, there's maybe been a, a process of uh, kind of professionalization of the security forces, maybe. Who, who knows? I, I, don't, I don't quite know. But um, so, you know, we, we've had some statements by a number of officials saying that the besiege has been helping the law enforcement forces, which kind of, again, you know, reinforces my impression that it, the, the LEF is, is, is the lead, besiege supports them, and then there was a statement by, I think, the IRGC spokesman saying, or commander, saying that IRGC units have been deployed to three uh, central uh, provinces. Now, let me just say also, again, it, it's really hard to get your arms around this. My impression was is that in the past, Iran has devoted a lot of resources to creating um, internal security capabilities in the big cities. So in, in Iran, you have the, um, in Tehran, you have the Sarallah uh, base operation center or, or headquarters. And, and Sarallah, they have exercises, they put on the videos, and these are guys that, you know, it's IRGC and besiege um, and, and, and um, on motorcycles, and it's mainly internal security. Now, if they were planning for, by and large, if most of their assets are in the Tehran areas and other big cities, and now you have a nationwide protest in mid midsize and, and small you know, cities and towns, you know, they, in, they, they need time to redeploy these guys. Um, I, I don't think they were really set up to deal with a small town and, or rural protest movement. It was mainly the infrastructure was in the big cities and especially in Tehran. So that's one thing that I think we'll see investment in the coming years. And, and when I talk about, you know, um, diversion of resources from, you know, regional defense and power projection to internal security, that's one area I think they're going to have to focus on. You know, they had this infrastructure that, that was built in the big cities because of 99 and 2009. Now it's going to have to become also in small towns and, and uh, medium-sized and uh, in, in smaller cities. Great. We have a question over here. Uh, hello, it's Russian Embassy. My name is Alher Lukmanov. 
uh, it was interesting to to witness uh, this uh, very thoughtful discussion. I just have some, uh, two small minor remarks with regard to uh, Russia and its stance on what's going on in Iran. We've never said it was inspired from outside. What we said um, to avoid uh, manipulations uh, or some speculations on what's going on, and it, it's it goes with the principle of non-interference. We view it as an internal matter, internal affair of Iran, and it's about the government and the Iranian people to decide, and we're sure they will address it. They are now doing things. They, of course, finding remedies, solutions to it. And secondly, uh, why, why it is so, uh, except for it is the international law, uh, that uh, it's, it's our neighbor. Uh, that's uh, with regard to the, what kind of relations we have with Iran. It's our neighbor. Uh, it's been a long time on a neighbor, and uh, it's a friendly country for us. Uh, and uh, we have a lot of uh, and different kinds of relationship with them bilaterally. Uh, so we believe that uh, the best way to for the security, for the peace in the region, and for the internal security in Iran and other countries is simply to adhere to this non-interference principle. Thank you. Uh, by the way, one of our colleagues, uh, Anna Borshevskaya, had a piece uh, that we distributed is on the Hill, in which he said, uh, in fact, uh, the Russian reaction to these developments was much more uh, restrained in its comments than uh, in Russian reactions to protest movements elsewhere. And she thought that was quite an interesting phenomenon. Okay, more questions? All right, well, if we don't have, uh, oh wait, we have one more question in the back. Right before the buzzer, go ahead. <laughs> Thanks. Um, well, I, I was uh, wondering what what uh, Patrick's uh, response was to my earlier question, but I, I do want to ask uh, about uh, you, know, you know about the internal uh, uh, order. But but uh, but also a question for Patrick: the picture you described is really quite looks quite desperate. I mean, the economic situation uh, is. Do you think it will in fact collapse? And if so, what happens then? Well, can I can I just uh, add to that question one please. thing, Patrick, which is um, the economic situation has not been great uh, in 2017, but it was a lot worse before. Um, and many of the things you said have been true for a long time. Uh, lots of spending on foreign uh, priorities, lots of unemployment, inflation, and so forth. Um, so to supplement Hillel's question, um, I might ask what makes today different? Look, uh, the macroeconomic situation is pretty good. And the government's got quite a lot of margin to, uh, in fact, uh, resolve the country's problems. I mean, uh, um, in spite of Ahmadinejad's best efforts to, to steal everything that wasn't nailed down and lots of things that were nailed down, um, as far as we can tell, the uh, government debt is still smaller relative to GDP than in the United States. And the deficit certainly smaller, right? And the banking system's in bad shape, but boy, nothing compared to the situation in a country like Iceland or Cyprus. I mean, it's frankly kind of like ordinary, like more like Greece or Italy and uh, Spain. And, and we have lots of experience of how to deal with these things. Uh, and, and there are lots of people who could provide good advice, uh, like, you know, from the International Monetary Fund and other institutions about what to do. Uh, but it's been impressive. They spent two years dithering about what are modest changes in the central bank's authority. And they haven't been talking about setting up a bad bank that has all the bad loans and recapitalizing the banking system and doing the other kinds of things you have to do when you have a real serious banking crisis. But, you know, it's nothing like the scale of the banking crisis that we saw in, 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 in Cyprus and, uh, and, and in Iceland, two countries which dealt very effectively with that banking crisis. <coughs> So it's the, um, it's the inability of authorities to take uh, tough decisions that's the fundamental problem here. And in fact, uh, it would be quite possible to resolve these economic problems. And similarly, um, you know, there's been quite reasonable economic growth. And I one can imagine a set of economic policies which directed that growth more towards ordinary people. But what we've seen instead is the Rouhani government is doing the kinds of things that my ex-colleagues, the IMF, would approve of, um, which is uh, taking the easy route out for finding ways to cut spending and uh, raise taxes that uh, ends up ha ha hitting the poor, and there's no trickle-down. That's not necessary. 
I mean, frankly, it would be quite possible to come up with a different set of policies uh, that, um, that, that addressed an awful lot of the concerns of ordinary people. I mean, a deposit insurance system for the banks, you know, that's, excuse me, I mean, there are very few countries in the world that don't have a deposit insurance system for banks. That's not revolutionary. It really would be quite possible to implement that. And then instead of having all those people out there in the streets in Tehran who, because they lost their entire life savings, those three to four million people that Rouhani referred to in his modulus budget speech who have completely ruined, I mean, you could address that problem. It really wouldn't be that hard. And, and it has been, I mean, I have to say that I'm impressed by the economic incompetence of successive Iranian governments in not dealing with these things. There's clearly a deadlock uh, and decision-making, a partisan deadlock and decision-making in Tehran, which is much worse than the partisan deadlock and decision-making here in Washington. All right. Well, that brings us to the end of our time. So let me um, first thank our panelists. Um, I want to also thank you. I want to also thank our staff around the room who assisted with the events uh, and thank all of you for coming. Have a good day.